all right, mood stabilizers, or we should just say lithium. So we have a 35-year-old woman who was hospitalized for a manic episode for several weeks, or several weeks ago. With medication, her mania resolved. She slept through the night and was subsequently discharged. She now presents to her primary care physician with complaints of frequent urination, weight gain, and tremor. A physical examination reveals an enlarged thyroid gland. The drug responsible for these adverse reactions also causes which of the following congenital abnormalities in a fetus if taken by a pregnant mother? So what is the congenital anomaly that is seen in a patient who has mania, who has now had frequent urination, waking, and tremor? So she's most likely been placed on lithium. So what is the congenital anomaly that's seen in patients taking lithium who are having babies? The answer is Epstein's anomaly. Epstein's anomaly, you just have to remember, is the congenital anomaly that you can see in patients who are pregnant taking lithium. So, as I've said multiple times already, you are all very, you are all experts and uh, understand the nuances of some of these uh, psych diseases much more so than I do. But just to make sure we're on the same page and sort of give you a broad idea of what's going on. Uh, we're going to be talking about bipolar. There are a few different types. Bipolar 1, prolonged, or severe manic, and are mixed episodes. We have bipolar 2, it's presenting as hypomania, as well as periods of major depression. And then we have cyclothymia, sort of our stable, uh, stable level of hypomania and mild depression. So what do we do for these patients? Well, we can give them mood stabilizers or lithium. We can give them antipsychotics like olanzapine and aripiprazole, or we can put them on anticonvulsants like valproate, lamotrigine, or carbamazepine. But primarily what we're going to be doing is working with lithium. Now it's very important to understand all of the facts here about lithium, except for one I'll get to in a second. Lithium is sort of, it's like another corticosteroid type drug, warfarin, or methyltrexate, where I said everything on the page is important. This is one of those where you have to just know it all, except for its mechanism of action. I wrote it's an inositol depletion, a depleter, works on the PLCIP3 signaling cascade. We actually don't really know how I, uh, lithium works. I've included it here as sort of, uh, you know, to give you an idea. Um, or if anybody were ever to pimp you or something like that to give you, you can throw around some facts, but we don't really know how it works. And this is sort of what I was able to find. So don't worry too much about the mechanism. It's a use. It's actually the only drug truly effective in bipolar and it can treat mania and actually prophylactically treat mania. So you can give it to a patient to prophylactically treat for manic events. It has a very narrow therapeutic window. Therefore, you know, patients are constantly coming in to get their levels checked and uh, the dose needs to be dialed just right because, you know, it's a very small window of being ineffective, being effective, and being toxic. It takes about five to seven days to become effective, which is important when we talk about some of the other agents. It's renally excreted and lithium actually competes with sodium for reabsorption in the renal proximal tubule. So, you know, sodium can actually inhibit the reabsorption. Pregnancy, we talked about this in that question stem, and uh, there really is no other way to memorize it but to memorize it that uh, lithium just causes this Epstein's malformation. I'm not too sure off the top of my head what that was. You can Google it. I, it's sort of just one of those minor players. I would associate it with lithium. It's not like a terology of flow or a patent ductus arteriosus or a or a uh, spina bifida type um, congenital defect where they're really going to expect you to know a lot, whole lot about it. This tends to just be a malformation that is associated with lithium, and that's as far as I would take it. It's contraindicated in patients who have renal impairment and sex sinus syndrome being that, you know, SA nodal block. Now, there are two different types of toxicity with lithium. There is the acute toxicity, and then there's the chronic toxicity. Now, acute toxicity stems from patients who have, you know, in the name, acutely taken a whole bunch of the medication. So if I, you know, maybe take 10 or 20 pills of lithium, you're going to start to see some of these symptoms. That would be tremor, fatigue, weakness. 
You could also see nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, but um, after tremor, what you're really going to start to see is ataxia and mental confusion. And then once you start to move on from ataxia, then you'll have some LOC, some loss of, con loss of consciousness, and possibly coma. To treat patients for acute lithium toxicity, you can, um, you know, if you gave them too much, you can change that dose and make it a smaller dose. You can also uh, give them a ton of fluids and, if need be, possibly dialyze the patient. Next, we have the chronic toxicity, and this is for patients who have been on the drug for uh, long periods of time and, you know, just develop these side effects as a side, uh, develop these side effects as a consequence of just taking the drug over long term. One of the bigger ones is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So we have uh, polyuria and polydipsia is how these how this presents. We're not able to concentrate our urine, therefore we're just continuously peeing and we're very thirsty. This is because the lithium actually can cause a decrease in the kidney's response to ADH, which is our nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The treatment for this is amylaride. It can also cause lithium, that is, thyroid enlargement, chronic interstitial nephritis, a glomerulopathy, and edema from NA retention because if we are, uh, yeah, because of NA retention. In addition, there are some other things that will increase or decrease lithium levels. And as we said, there's a narrow therapeutic window, so it's important to know a few of these. I would say the biggest one to know is how salt will increase or decrease lithium levels. So things that will increase our lithium levels are less salt intake. Now, this can be explained because, as we said before, uh, sodium and lithium compete at the proximal, tubule, com, proximal convoluted tubule for reabsorption. So if salt and lithium are competing, if we take less salt in, more lithium is going to be reabsorbed because there's less salt in that proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, lithium levels can also be increased by NSAIDs, ACE and ARBs, and thiazide diuretics. Things that can decrease sodium le lithium levels, I'm sorry, are an increased salt intake. As we just explained, if you are competing at the proximal convoluted tubule with lithium and sodium, if you have more sodium, now the competition is sort of going to be shifted into the sodium category, and so more sodium is going to get reabsorbed, therefore your lithium is going to get peed out. Uh, caffeine and theophylline can also both decrease lithium levels. And a last few bit of our anti-manic drugs, we have um, uh, valproate, valproic acid, and divalproex. Those are all the same drug, but um, people tend to throw around that word around, throw that word around a lot. And it isn't a brand or generic thing. People just like to, especially doctors and nurses, they like to refer to valproic acid as many different things. So this is one you actually do have to know because you will get tricked on. You'll see, you'll see divalproex, and you'll go, what, you know, what is that? And it's it's actually just valproic acid or valproate. It's all the same. So I wouldn't worry too much about the mechanism. It's a voltage-gated sodium blocker, but it can also increase GABA concentration by inhibiting GABA transaminases, breaking down GABA. Um, but what I would worry about for about proate is the side effects. It can cause sedation and ataxia, and it's extremely high yield to know that it is actually it is teratogenetic, teratogenic, causing spina bifida like um, spectrum of congenital abnormalities, which um, if a patient has to be on this for whatever reason, we would treat that with high dose folic acid. So uh, this actually has been found to be more... Uh, I have a faster onset in treating menia than lithium. So uh, you can see a patient who will come in, be given in a manic episode, be given some valproate, and then be switched to lithium after their treatment is completed. However, it's unclear whether it is better or equal to lithium in treatment of uh, bipolar long-term. Another agent is carbamazepine. This is another voltage gadium sodium channel blocker. Uh, again, really got to know the side effects, uh, diplopia, ataxia, it's liver toxic, it's also one of our friendly drugs that can cause our Stevens-Johnson syndrome. 
It has some hematologic effects, and one of the biggest ones that you really do have to know is a granulocytosis. It can cause SIEDH. We just talked about uh, lithium causing uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Well, now we have a syndrome of inappropriate ADH hormone, so we're not peeing enough. So it is also teratinogenic. And finally, uh, there is a drug interaction that this loves to be tested. Uh, it is also an inducer of the cytochrome P450 system. However, it's a little bit tricky with carbamazepine because it is actually metabolized by the same CYP enzymes that it's inducing. So we call this auto-induction. So it's inducing the enzymes that are going to metabolize the drug themselves. So uh, we will put patients on this drug and slowly have to increase the levels over time because they're, the drug is actually increasing its own metabolism. So just a little bit of a summary for some of the ways that we can treat bipolar uh, disorder. So for acute manic episodes, we can use benzos, we can use lithium or valproic acid. Hopefully my Mac makes it. Uh, we can use, uh, chronically, we can use um, lithium or lamotrigine, as we talked about. For treatment resistance or rapid cyclers, we can use valproic acid, um, uh, shock therapy, or some other things like carbamazepine, olanzapine, and aripiprazole, some of the antipsychotics we talked about. Finally, the biggest, one of the bigger points is for our depressive episodes, we just want to make sure that we don't use an SSRI alone. And SSRIs on their own when treating a depressive episode that is part of a bipolar disorder can precipitate mania. And that's something we do not want.